Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming on Friday. It's not our usual day. We have great pleasure to have Chin uh, Feng and Wang here from uh, the UK. So Chin uh, Feng did her PhD in the University of Manchester, and now she works in Birmingham, Birmingham University, and she works interdisciplinary, right? And yes. look on the whole picture. And sometimes, especially here in Spray, we like really focus on what we do and how we make uh, ourselves <coughs> better and it's interesting to look at the big picture and how we can use uh, interdiscipline to improve the world. So looking forward to hear about your uh, interesting research. Thank you very much for coming all the way from the UK here. Thank you so much Steve for having me here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so as, as you've already introduced, I'm Xin Fang and I'm currently a research fellow in University of Birmingham. So um, I work on different projects, uh, interdisciplinaries, and mainly look at uh, policy, innovation, uh, behaviors, and social practices in relation to energy. So yeah, kind of social science focused. Uh, so today maybe uh, I think I'll give a talk about um, energy resilience, uh, combining some of the projects I do both in the UK but also in uh, uh, other more developing countries such as uh, Mexico and uh, Nepal as well to trying to compare the differences in the different uh, contexts. Um, so uh, when, I t when I mention about uh, resilience, um, uh, obviously, resilience has been mentioned in uh, different contexts and different disciplines. Uh, so it's firstly introduced as a uh, descriptive uh, ecological term, but then has been used uh, in other like geography, sociology, and economic disciplines as well. Uh, there is one uh, emphasis on uh, resilience, which is about the coping with uh, external stresses, which could be uh, shocks like uh, earthquakes or flooding, but could also be a uh, long-term uh, distress such as financial distress or society's um, distress as well. Um, so uh, when we think about the energy system, so the use of term resilience is to mainly look at things as a um, systems approach. So when we look at energy sector, we could lo also look at energy as a complex system, which uh, has to cope with um, shocks and distress in, uh, distress in terms of uh, energy supply and energy demand and energy efficiency involved as well. So um, one of my uh, research interests is to look at what could be the uh, different factors that would, re, um, would influence energy resilience. So if we have like um, energy disruption, uh, how could we cope with it? Or how could the energy system actually prepare itself in terms of any potential uh, disruption in the future? So if we have uh, electricity shot because of uh, earthquake and flooding, how the system could uh, deal with that to be uh, resilient? Um, and then I also want to look at what could be um, the influences between those different arrivals that influence the energy resilience as a whole. Um, so to explore a bit more about the concept of energy resilience, but uh, maybe more focus on um, local level, uh, I will start to discuss this uh, from uh, three case studies. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a case study in Nepal, which will mainly focus on uh, energy resilience mapping, uh, with a slightly more focus on institutional framework uh, because of their recent uh, governance decentralization agenda and their new constitution related to see how this might influence their uh, energy system decentralization. And uh, also look at UK uh, from some projects I did um, partly look at uh, multi-level governance from national, uh, regional to local levels and also its um, technological innovation system. How could that um, be applied at the local level? Uh, and then finally, I will lo also look at a case in uh, Mexico. This will more focus on the social aspects to try to think about how energy services could link with the capabilities and well-being with a case study in the rural area. So to start uh, with the case in Nepal, where we first looked at um, energy resilience mapping, uh, which we carried out a case study in the Kathmandu Valley. 
So this project is titled as Long-Term Institutional Change in the Wake of Crisis, where long-term long institutional change, as I mentioned, is about their uh, governance decentralization agenda and the new constitution, and then how could that um, maybe help with the uh, energy system decentralization uh, in the country to deal with future energy shocks. Um, and we took the starting point from the there are 2015 earthquakes uh, to see how the city have um, uh, have changed uh, after the earthquakes uh, for their uh, reconstruction. And so this project is funded by the Institute for Global Innovation uh, at the University of Birmingham, and I work under the one of the themes which is about uh, resilient cities. So we do different uh, research projects uh, all over the. Uh, world, especially in developing countries, uh, but also not only in Nepal, but also like in Africa and uh, India and some other countries as well. So in these projects, we collaborated with different stakeholders, uh, both from the central government uh, to local authorities, but also private sector and NGOs as well. Um, so uh, for the collection of data, uh, it was mainly a participatory approach where I uh, and two of my colleagues, we did a workshop together uh, involving those stakeholders from the different sectors, uh, especially to ask them to uh, talk about resilience. So as this um, picture here shows, so we asked the, all the stakeholders to come up with all the variables that they think would uh, influence energy resilience in Nepal. So all these uh, post-it notes are all the variables that they came up with. And we also ask them to draw the links uh, of between those variables to see uh, how they actually influence each other. So all these links are drawn by the uh, stakeholders as well. Uh, and uh, we also, um, like separate from this workshop, we took some other semi-structured interviews as well, uh, focusing on uh, governments and also selected uh, three different uh, local authorities. Um, but also involved other private, private sectors, universities and NGO. So we asked uh, them separately uh, to collect uh, data uh, and we want to compare how the data are actually consistent and con contradict with the data we find from the workshop. So from this um, mapping that um, the stakeholders come up with at this uh, workshop, then I, I analyzed it with a software called uh, Vansom. So in this software, I basically put all the variables here on this map that the stakeholders come up with, and I draw all the links that they come up with, uh, with as well. So for the links, you can see some of them has a plus sign and some has a minus. So plus means there is a positive link between the variables, uh, while minus would be a neg negative link uh, between these. So uh, basically, I moved those uh, variables uh, um, in this map, and I could basically categorize them into four uh, types. So one is uh, government re uh, re governance related, and then technology related, and uh, society related, and also economic related. So uh, within this map, as you can see, there are many loops in this map. So this red colored one is just one example of the loop in this mapping. Um, so basically, there are two types of uh, loops, uh, the causal loops. One is a balancing loop, one is a reinforcing loop. So if uh, uh, they are reinforcing loop, so this red colored one is a reinforcing loop because all those influences are positive. So um, for example, if we start with this uh, variable of uh, research and development, which belong to the technology um, category, and then uh, the research and development of the technology will then influence the technology innovation, and then the innovation will influence, the, for example, the efficiency of the appliances, and then the efficiency will then uh, influence uh, how people might adopt those new technology. Uh, which then might lead to um, equity issues, depends on who will adopt them, uh, what are the conditions uh, that for those people to adopt them, which then may cause uh, social trust issues and then affect uh, people's well-being. And then uh, people's well-being will then influence how, pe uh, how consumers will behave in terms of their energy use, uh, which then might uh, lead to whether they will um, adopt particular policy measures such as uh, smart tariffs. 
and then how many people and who is going to adopt a smart tariff will then affect the running of the business, uh, which then affects the employment status. Uh, and then the employment might affect, uh, for example, the business model of public-private partnership, which then again influence the research and the development of the technology. So, for example, in this reinforcing loop, if you change one of the variables, then it will not only influence all the other variables in the different categories, but also lead to a re-enhancing impact back to this variable and of the energy resilience as a whole. Um, so uh, this is uh, the analysis that we uh, have done from the workshop data collected. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we also collected data from interviews. And actually, the interviews back up with this analysis we have done from the workshop data. Uh, so one of the interviewees uh, actually said, uh, well, if we actually followed the technical parameter, the financial parameter, the institutional parameter, and social parameter, and then the project will become in you know, a more uh, sustainable way. So this is uh, very consistent with the categories that uh, I just showed you from the mapping. So then I will um, discuss a bit more from these different uh, parameters. So if we start with the governance uh, aspect, as I mentioned, so uh, also in this workshop in Nepal, we asked the stakeholders to come up with all the actors that are actually involved in the energy governance in Nepal and the actors across different scales to, uh, from the national to uh, uh, regional to local level and also across uh, different sectors from uh, electricity to um, E uh, electricity to uh, maybe um, heating and other sectors and also across private and public sectors as well. Um, and then uh, what we found uh, from this um, governance aspect for the Nepal case study is that um, um, the decentralization of their governance agenda is kind of separate from their energy system decentralization where they look at uh, mini grids from hydro or solar. Uh, but from governance level, they had a merge of ministers uh, reduced from maybe about 70 to uh, uh, just over 30 now for them to have a better coordination uh, between each other, like between energy minister and also finance and local affairs. And we think that municipalities could potentially play a bigger role in the rural areas, which has more uh, serious um, access issues to energy as the city areas, they are mainly con uh, managed by the National Electricity Authority, um, so by the central governance uh, level. Um, we see there is gap of policy process across the uh, different scales from national to local, uh, especially for the local authorities. They uh, don't have the adequate skills, uh, experience and the resources for their local energy system innovation and the development. So they might uh, already received some of the funding from central government, but not quite sure uh, what, should, uh, what projects should be uh, undertaken from there. Um, and we think that local authorities, they would need to collaborate better with the national governments, uh, not only in the energy sector, but uh, also in finance and other housing sectors. Uh, as well as private and NGO, and especially with local communities, because if we look at uh, energy decentralization, we have to connect to the community who will actually need to accept for those, um, uh, for those mini grids to be taken place in their area. So uh, moving from Nepal to the UK, I also did some projects in the UK, which focused on decentralization of governance and energy system. Um, for this once, um, I took a case study uh, focusing on energy storage. So uh, most of my work is uh, related to renewable energy and uh, energy storage, and I'm in the Center for Energy Storage in the University of Birmingham as well. Um, and for those projects, we tried to find um, the institutional framework currently in the, in the UK and see how that might uh, be a barrier or help with the develop, uh, deployment of uh, energy storage at a distributed level. So again, we want to find all the actors from the different sectors like um, uh, power, heating and transport sectors across different scales to see how the actors interact with each other. And also to look at uh, within so many local authorities in the UK, why some of them have taken more energy projects while others haven't uh, done any. 
and then uh, to try to see if there are gaps of policy process across the national devolved and the local levels. So uh, in terms of the data, um, I used uh, some uh, data that has been uh, collected by the University of Edinburgh from a project that they did. So I updated their data set and I explored the funding source of all the energy related projects uh, for 333 local authorities in the UK. And now I also took a small case study of Birmingham uh, as uh, one of the energy leader among these local authorities. And then I mapped the Birmingham's projects, the funding source and the partners involved in those projects as well uh, from document analysis, but also uh, will carry out interviews with stakeholders as well. Um, and then in terms of the funding, I also mapped uh, all the funding uh, for the projects funded by the UK Research and Innovation, uh, focusing on energy storage, uh, to look at how they are allocated to different local uh, enterprise partners within the Western Midlands region. So Birmingham belongs to one of these local enterprise partners, uh, which belong to this West Midlands region. So then uh, what we found is, uh, so first from the uh, funding source for the different projects among the over 300 and, uh, local authorities, uh, we found that, um, uh, so basically all these local authorities are categorized into um, three categories, uh, energy leaders, uh, running hard and starting blocks. So among the leaders, Normally, each local authority have undertaken maybe uh, between seven to eight uh, projects so uh, in this 10-year um, period we looked at. And running hard, they have taken some, but less than the energy leaders. And the starting blocks, they may just uh, only had, uh, have started one, or they haven't started a project, but they already had an energy strategy in place. So we found that uh, among those uh, different categories, uh, it seems that the energy leaders and the running hearts, they have more uh, diverse funding source than the starting blocks here. So all this percentage represent for the number of projects because the uh, amount of investment are not available for all those projects here. And then... Uh, the one devolved nations? Mm. The devolved nations? Oh, those are uh, Scotland, England, uh, Wales, uh, oh. and so on, yeah. And then uh, when I looked at uh, Birmingham as a case study, um, so this data mainly collected during this 10-year uh, period. So uh, all those um, projects uh, undertaken by Birmingham uh, are here in the circled ones. Uh, so those ones circled in blue, they are mainly funded by the European uh, funding. And the ones circled in the yellow here, uh, mainly funded by the UK uh, central level. Uh, and then all those um, green ones are he circled here as projects or investment, and then the purple dots are mainly uh, the um, uh, institutions involved. So as you can see, like at least during this period of time, uh, although Birmingham has taken lots, um, lo has undertaken lots of projects, but mainly relied on funding from the national and European level rather than the city level. And then if we look at all the institutions across different sectors uh, for the Birmingham, so if we start from the city level, we have the Birmingham City Council here, uh, which mainly work uh, with uh, the universities, uh, Birmingham and Aston University. Uh, and Birmingham, as I mentioned, is uh, one of the local enterprise, which is called Greater Birmingham and Solihull. Uh, and then uh, along with this, um, local enter enterprise partnership, there are two others, Black Country and Coventry, uh, also belong to this West Midlands region. So this is more of a regional level. And then at this West Midlands, uh, the larger regional level, uh, there are also different uh, institutions involved from the, uh, for example, the West Midlands Combined Authority, uh, and also work with uh, transport for the West Midlands um, and also uh, innovation alliance and uh, sustainable housing partnership as well. Uh, and also energy capital, which is a uh, relative new initiative to help the West Midlands to deliver their energy projects. Um, so uh, the West Midlands is then again belong to the Midlands region. 
And then the Midlands region, you can see there are also different partners involved in the energy projects, such as the Investment Hub, uh, Midlands Connect, Midland Innovation, Midland Engine, uh, which then uh, also under the national level. So at the national level, you can see we have a central government uh, base, which is the main res um, uh, department for energy business and industrial strategy. And we have Ofgem, uh, which is the regulator of uh, electricity and gas. And we have uh, a cut to uh, research projects as well. So all those links here are uh, from the document analysis, which I looked at all the documents to see which institute works with which ones. And there's no uh, very consistent uh, uh, approach that who is actually working with which level and to which partners. Uh, so which is not quite uh, consistent in terms of how the energy projects is carried out across different scales with the institutions involved. Um, and then again focus on the energy storage and the funding related. Uh, so I looked at how the government funding uh, on energy storage has been allocated in the West Midlands to the three different uh, local energy partnerships that I previously mentioned. So Birmingham belong to this one here. Uh, so all those um, ones are the projects has been funded by the UK Research and Innovation during this period of time. And the different colors are what the funding has been used for. So if they are purple, they've been used for mainly for research. If it's green, it's for feasibility studies. Uh, if it's blue, it's for uh, like PhD studentship. Um, so you can see that um, the uh, Greater Birmingham and Solihull one, as well the, as the Coventry and Warwick share one, they received most of the funding. Um, but they are mainly for research, so either like purple or blue, more blue in this area, but uh, it's both for research and uh, PhD studentships. Um, uh, well, partly because most of the universities in the West uh, Midlands are allocated in this to uh, local enterprise partnership area. And then uh, in the other uh, area, you can see a bit more of the green ones, which are for um, technology feasibility studies. Uh, as they have more industry there. But overall, you can see there are uh, a lot more funding on research and not quite so many funding on feasibility studies, which potentially show maybe there is a gap between the research and uh, uh, deployment of those technologies. Um, so key points from uh, this um, policy perspective in the UK, and we think that um, uh, taking energy storage as an example, we see the multi-level of uh, governance involved and also lack of intermediaries uh, that could transfer knowledge between policy and, uh, research and uh, uh, policy or deployment of technology. So uh, uh, for Birmingham as a case study, it has been addressed partly with uh, Green Commission of the Council and also the new energy capital that I mentioned, but not being quite consistent. So for example, the Green Commission has not had any meeting in the past few years. Um, and we think that uh, um, kind of similar to the Nepal case. So the local decision makers, they are constrained in their ability to deploy energy storage, so which could have a potential of uh, deployment of the smart local energy system uh, in general as well. And so moving from this governance aspect to now uh, technology and innovation area, which was also one of the category in the energy resilience mapping. Uh, so uh, I had, um, worked on one project which uh, look at, again, energy storage as an example to see the innovation, um, focusing on the lithium-ion batteries, which is a relative uh, mature technology in the energy storage area. Um, so uh, in terms of energy storage, the innovation could be different from other uh, renewable energy storage because for energy storage is quite uh, dependent on how much uh, and what renewables are actually applied in the system, in the energy system. So it, there is more like uh, interdependence nature of energy storage in the system. So I uh, used the technological innovation system approach and I looked at the the input, output, and outcome indicators across uh, different uh, innovation stages of the technology from research to development to uh, uh, deployment uh, and so on. And compare UK with some other countries, uh, like now the ma uh, main manufacturers in, uh, for example, Asia and uh, America. So uh, we want to look at uh, how this innovation performance uh, 
uh, could uh, help or um, become a barrier for the technology innovation. So uh, for the lithium ion battery, as I uh, mentioned slightly, so the pioneering work of the research was uh, initially in uh, the UK uh, by Professor John Goodenough's group uh, when he was in Oxford. And then uh, the birth of the modern uh, lithium ion battery uh, was uh, seen as done by a Japanese company uh, where they patented a uh, lithium ion battery in 1980s. And then driven by the large demand of uh, portable electronic devices, especially of mobile phones. Um, and then Sony re released the first commercial lithium ion battery in 1990s. And since then, there's continued uh, improvement of the energy density and also reduction of the cost. Uh, and then uh, more recent applications are more driven uh, by even larger scales like EVs and stationary energy storage. So uh, as I mentioned, I used uh, uh, this uh, innovation, uh, uh, sorry, indicator framework to look at uh, the different inputs and different outputs and also different outcome indicators across different innovation stages from research to development uh, demonstration and uh, to the market formation. So some of the examples, so for example, we look at uh, the cost reduction and the uh, improvement of installed uh, capacity across different uh, uh, lithium ion battery applications such as uh, uh, EVs and uh, also application in residential and utility uh, sectors. And we also look at uh, how uh, uh, the funding for energy storage as an input indicator here. How does that link to the output, for example, like uh, journal publications from here? And also then how the input of energy funding could uh, link with the patent come up with uh, afterwards, which is true in the blue line here. Uh, those are mainly focused on, in, uh, on the UK. So uh, what we found from this uh, case study of uh, lithium and battery from technology innovation set uh, is that um, uh, it seems that the full value of lithium ion battery was not clear at the early stage when it was first researched in the UK in 1970s. Uh, and the cost reduction was due to a variety of different sectors, uh, sorry, different factors, from uh, increase of installed capacity to uh, R&D investment to economic of scale from uh, supply chain improvement and also spillover uh, e effects. Uh, so, as an enabler of this low carbon transition, um, the energy storage has positive externalities and spillovers that markets will not value sufficiently, so which would be a barrier for uh, deploy it at an uh, efficient scale um, within the necessary, necessary time scales and uh, uh, emission reduction and climate change. And also we see the economic uh, Upcharge will transfer the intellectual property across the market from the early research done in the UK uh, to now the main uh, upscale manufacturers to, uh, in the US and also uh, Asia like China, uh, Korea and Japan as well. So this is just an example we did uh, focusing on technology and innovation aspects. Then also about uh, social aspects, as I mentioned, is another area within the energy resilience mapping. So for the social aspects, I will introduce from the Mexico projects we did uh, with a case study of a rural area called uh, Tlamacazapa. Uh, so th in this one, we collaborated with the Mexican, uh, Mexican National Institute of uh, Electricity and Clean Energy. And our aim is to um, identify a list of uh, project uh, options with uh, renewable and energy storage technology to see which one would provide the greatest benefits for the area that we undertake as a case study. Uh, so in this one, as I mentioned, we mainly want to look at the link between the energy use and energy service services to their develop, uh, development capabilities and uh, well-being. Uh, and we collected the data from uh, four focus groups uh, from last November and which are arranged by the gender and the age for these four groups for better communication and the data, uh, data collection. So um, for this one, when we look at uh, well-being, 
uh, we used uh, the central capabilities approach, uh, which is a multidimensional approach to understand uh, well-being and the develop development. So we covered these uh, dimensions here, from health to security to uh, li make a living to education. Uh, and I will just mention some of them here as an example to see what we did. So we looked at both the, the people's current situation and their aspirations of what we, they want. Uh, and to benefit their well-being. So for their current situation in terms of uh, energy linking to their health issues, so they mainly cook with um, fair wood, uh, which creates smoke and uh, um, cause lots of health issues, especially for women and children. Also, there's uh, serious lack of clean pumped water. Uh, there is lack of water and the electricity is very expensive to uh, pump water for them as well. And uh, for refrigeration, it is potentially very important for medicines for their um, diabetes issues in that particular uh, village. Uh, but most people can't afford it, and they use uh, ice flasks for their uh, storing their personal medicines. And they have one health center which has a refrigeration, but they don't have other uh, medical appliances that need electricity to power them. And also for security, people mainly mentioned there is no street lighting. So people are supposed to, to leave one light on in their backyard for other people to use. But they, uh, most people don't do it because the cost, uh, cost of electricity is too expensive. And also um, people, so people are afraid of going out in the dark, uh, and which limits their activities. Um, and also, especially for young women, they are uh, particularly afraid of going out in the dark. Um, in the evenings. Uh, so people don't do work, they don't visit other relatives, and they can't play in the, um, uh, play in the outside as uh, either. Uh, also for um, firewoods that they use for cooking, collecting it could be difficult, especially when it rains. Um, then it could cause a danger for the women who mainly go to collect the firewood. And then for uh, making a living, so most people in the village, they make a living from making handcrafts. Uh, and uh, they don't have machines because they don't can't pay for machines and can't pay for electricity uh, to do the hand, uh, to do these products. Uh, so lack of lighting, which also restricts them to work in the evening for make a living. Uh, and also, uh, for example, they don't they don't have uh, enough water for irrigation. There's lack lack of electricity to pump the water and lack of water source. And uh, some people mentioned they actually want to do a small business, uh, food business business, but they don't um, they can't afford the power and they can't afford uh, the appliances either. And then uh, in terms of education, for example, the schools, they have computers, but they cannot use it because there's no electricity to use them. Um, and also, uh, for example, uh, the lighting issue that restricts the children to do their homework in the, in the evening. And also for the churches and the festivals, they also don't have ena uh, enough uh, electricity to carry out all their activities. So uh, then we uh, looked at uh, what people actually uh, want uh, to benefit um, mainly for their well-being improvement. So uh, we draw the diagrams in the, uh, a few slides to show uh, what people actually need in terms of their well-being and then how they could actually benefit from providing uh, more and cheaper electricity and water. Uh, I will just give uh, some of the examples. So in these diagrams, I've colored the well-being in green, so you can see how the well-being linked to their energy services. So this is one example for the lighting services you mentioned. Uh, so for example, this mentioned if they have street lighting, so first they will feel, uh, feel safe to go out. So if they can feel safe to go out, then the children could play outside, which is uh, good for their uh, recreation activity. So the young people can do sports and uh, well, adults as well, which is good for their health. And then if they have emergency at night, then they can go to doctor. And then they can also visit their friends, which is good for building their relationships. Uh, and then we, they can visit their working partners to make a living as well. And uh, if they can have cheaper electricity to, for lighting at home, they can do more handicrafts to make a living. Children can do homework for their education. And they can also uh, do more cooking in the evening as well. And then similar for lighting in the churches, if you, they can afford it uh, for better lights, then it's good for their relationships in, among the village and also for their religious practice. 
So if uh, they can have cheaper and uh, more electricity, they could benefit a lot for their different uh, capabilities here. And then similarly for the appliances they mentioned. So if the uh, medical center has more uh, appliances, that's good for people's health. Uh, if they can have fridge, they can store not only food. Uh, so now, now uh, at the moment, they only buy food to consume within one day because they can't uh, store it. And they can also store medicine for their health issue. And if they can have machines, that will uh, improve their productivity because most of the, the uh, bigger uh, supermarkets or uh, when they look for the uh, suppliers of products, they mainly look of uh, products of the same size. If they uh, can only do it with handcrafts, then they can't meet the criteria, so they lose lots of the business opportunities. Um, and similarly for computer and phone, they can help with their study uh, and communication as well, uh, which then improve uh, their education related and their communication with others. Then. Another example is like if they have a clean cooking to replace the fair wood they use. Again, the women and children, they will ha need uh, less time to go and collect the fair wood, less time uh, for cooking as well. Uh, so they can use the time to do more uh, homework for education, uh, do more handicrafts to make a living. They can then have more time to visit other relatives to build their relationship. And there's less indoor pollution, which is good for uh, their health and environment. And there's no need to cut the trees. So then in these examples, you can see how the energy service could link to their uh, capabilities and well-being to improve the social aspects in the uh, society and the community as a whole. Is it cheaper for them too, just to buy electricity rather than buying wood? Uh, not at the moment, so that's why they use fair wood. So uh, yeah, so uh, they did mention about they might want to try the electric uh, stoves and uh, gas. Induction particularly. Yeah, yeah, but it's expensive, yeah. To buy, but then cheaper to use. Mm, uh, well, the electricity cost there is very high, so they can't afford it, yeah. So that's why we think about maybe use solar and battery if uh, there's funding for that. So yeah, if we think about how we can provide electricity, we can provide in their home for the different lighting and cooking use. And we can also provide in the community level, like for street lighting or in the church and markets to improve their different capabilities. Uh, but the ma main constraints they mentioned is about the cost and the reliability of the uh, limited uh, su supplies. So cost of electricity is very high and they also uh, often have the power shut uh, and then they need to pay for the dis uh, disconnection um, before they could get reconnected again, which is another big cost for the people living, uh, living there. So they mainly use fair wood because it's cheap and it's mostly free if they collect it from the um, if they collect it themselves from outside. Um, and also uh, the reliability is another issue that they often have uh, power outage, uh, outage which uh, restrict their use of energy. So then we revisited this village again in April to actually look at um, their comments on different uh, projects that might hap uh, happen in the future if they have funding to see what are their priorities. So this is one of the well. Uh, there's, uh, there was no water there at all. Uh, when I went in November, there was uh, water, polluted one, but then uh, this time there wasn't any water. And this is uh, one of their water source. Uh, and that's where the village is located, like higher up. So they actually need a pumping water from uh, to the higher level. And so we, as I mentioned, I asked them to, uh, sorry, we asked them to discuss about potentially different projects that they might want to uh, happen in the village, like for street lighting, for water issue, uh, for uh, community uh, use, and for also for clean cooking. But we try to, uh, consider the integrated solutions of these different problems uh, tra rather than like for example solving one problem but lead to some other problems as a result. And we want to see how this uh, case in this one village could be replicable in other regions and other con countries as well, um, especially focusing on how energy service could help with the capabilities. Um, so I've mentioned uh, three uh, cases. Uh, which has been a long presentation. So some of the initial conclusions so far uh, from these uh, three case studies is we can see how these um, um, 
different contexts uh, uh, have different aspects in relation to energy resilience and what are the um, uh, key variables that are different in this different contexts from this governance uh, society and the technology innovation aspects. Uh, so especially if the multi-level governance has been seen as a particular um, influence in the Nepal and uh, uh, UK projects about how it uh, influenced the energy resilience. And then from the Mexico case study, we can see how the uh, energy resilience uh, could help potentially improve the well-being and the capabilities of the region. And also uh, from the UK uh, Lisa Mayan battery case study, we can see how the technology innovation system could then affect the different stage of the innovation and then therefore the energy resilience uh, uh, as well from this uh, technology, energy technologies innovation. Uh, some other projects that I won't uh, spend time to going through, but could also relate to energy resilience that are currently an ongoing in uh, my research team. So, for example, in India, we look at um, have uh, the have uh, could have the diesel generators uh, could be replaced uh, with renewables and battery, which might help with not only the energy resilience when they have electricity, uh, electricity disruption, but also reduce the emissions. And in Kenya, uh, we, uh, we are thinking about looking at the transformative adaptation of uh, uh, infrastructure to see um, the connectivity between urban and rural areas with uh, uh, example of the road infrastructure there. And then uh, in Euro uh, Europe level, we are looking at, uh, from technology side, we are looking at a, a demonstration of uh, cryogenic energy storage at a refrigerated, uh, refrigerated uh, warehouse to see how we could integrate renewable energy in the industrial food ref refrigeration. And then also in the UK level, we're not only looking at heating, but we are thinking about cooling as well. So one of the projects I'm involved is to predict the uptake of air conditioning in the UK uh, to say from social side uh, who are going to adopt it, why they might adopt air conditioning, and uh, how would that would uh, influence the energy system uh, demand and supply, and then what kind of uh, governance um, um, policy measures might need to be in place to deal with this uh, energy demand from uh, uh, more air conditioning in the future. Um, so next steps, we are thinking about develop this energy resilience framework uh, further, considering all the different aspects, and then compare the developing and developed countries uh, in with more case studies. But uh, also, especially think about how this energy resilience could link to the capabilities and well-being uh, in these countries. And then, if we are thinking about Australia here. Uh, then we might think that the energy resilience uh, picture would be different here because you have maybe different uh, governance uh, structure and different external stresses on the energy system here. And there may be also other aspects that uh, influence the resilience but have not covered in these different categories. So uh, yeah, I will stop there and uh, look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, sorry, Kasper. Um, thank you for your talk. I thought um, especially the maps of the complex systems were really interesting. But I was wondering, like, eventually everything is connected to everything. Um, so when do you stop? Like when do you think like, okay, now I've had enough relationships and this is the system? Time to settle down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, from this uh, stakeholder workshop, uh, it's actually, um, at least it shows what people are thinking are the more important links between these variables than the others. So that's why like, why they come up with those links rather than links everywhere in the framework itself. So that's kind of one approach to say, um, if we do this thing in different countries, different contexts, then actually the stakeholders may come up with different uh, uh, main links that they will put and the variables they will put in the mapping. Um, the thought of it, it's great, you're really focusing on, like your first question is how, 
you know, how can we improve these situations and how can we improve the transition and what are the factors and you know, I feel like when we focus on technology or we focus on this or that, we can just get into our tunnel and not actually be putting the you know, effort in the right place. I think this is really important. It's done a lot of work, covered a lot of territory. So it's well done. Um, Thank you. I, was, I guess one, one thing from it was um, thinking with the Mexican thing, um, you know, I, I have friends who are in the same situation. I think the situation that you've described there for that village is very common around the world. Um, and I th maybe you led somewhere else, but it, it was like tantalizing. You're saying, you know, the, the technology is available. Um, it would meet all of these needs, it would make all these improvements. You know, there's a dot, dot, dot there. So, and, and it's funding, isn't it? And is there a way to open up goodwill of, of, of the West to <laughs> help that happen? You know? Donald Trump could help. Yeah, well, Donald Trump. Well, look, okay, so I'll, I'll level with you. I know, I know people who are in the same situation. Yeah. She's burning wood fire. Her children are suffering asthma. They have to, like, sort of lock the wood inside because it's raining outside. So, mm -hmm. um, and there's a, this is someone I know on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they have a, there's a stove in the store that's an induction stove, costs 50 bucks they're actually going to save money because they live in a city they can't collect firewood so they're going to save money once they're using electricity for the induction stove instead of the, the wood stove mm -hmm. i'll help with that but all her neighbors are the same and that whole area is the same and mm -hmm. all my neighbors are essentially the same if they knew that they could really change someone's life for 50 bucks and they knew the person and mm -hmm. could see the result they'd good do point. it too so mm -hmm. good point there's a possibility there i think to you know unlock um, a rapid transition through that sort of funding. I don't know how yeah. else you're going to do it. Yeah, I think, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, the um, learning between people within communities itself it could be a really big influence. But also, um, so the approach that, uh, for example, the one I use to try <coughs> to understand what are actually people's needs related is also important for the government and other stakeholders or donors to understand what people actually need because they might uh, have already put some money to carry out different projects on renewable energy and they might think that would be a big improvement but maybe they haven't really understand it from the um, ground level about what people actually need instead. Yeah. Hi, thanks for that fantastic presentation. Um, just a quick question in terms of specifically looking at Mexico. Uh, did you have uh, sort of looked at uh, the social norms and practices of these energy practices? Because some of these countries like Mexico, for example, let's say some of the cooking might actually require to use firewood cooking, tortillas and other slow cooking, so which might actually uh, sort of make them inclined towards such kind of practices. So did you have an opportunity to look at the social norms and practices and link that theory to energy practices and energy resilience. Um. Yeah, I think that's quite an uh, important uh, area. So I do aware like um, maybe uh, in other um, case studies and in other regions, they actually <coughs> do think that uh, firewood uh, cooking is preferred. Maybe people prefer the uh, flavor of the food cooked by it. But actually in this uh, particular case study in Mexico, uh, it wasn't quite the same as even for men, they were quite, um, interested in uh, replacing the firewood for the cooking for the women and uh, children's health improvement. And um, most, most of the men, they uh, go out of the village, they work uh, outside. So they are aware of other electricity and gas used for cooking and they do eat from food uh, made from that approach. And they uh, don't particularly have a preference with firewood. So uh, in terms of that um, uh, cooking practice in that village, um, so we do see a potential that uh, it could be replaced uh, uh, with uh, electricity and gas there, yeah. Uh, so it's a really nice presentation. Uh, actually, I'm from Nepal, so I can relate what you presented from Mexico. It's perfectly, it fits there as well. And when I'm looking at, like, when you're presenting, I'm looking at the data, like how you get our energy. And 76% of the total final consumption is coming from biofuel or mm. waste of the total so that is the chunk of energy is coming in and when you look at the sector wise 
75% going to the residential sector. And uh, the contribution of electricity is just 3% in the total final consumption. So now the problem is we are pretty much locked in. We need to use those kind of like fuel wood and the stuff to survive. And <coughs> after the earthquake, we received a huge amount of induction cooktops from China. And it was just stuck <coughs> in, uh, it just <coughs> dumped, nobody used, because we don't have energy yeah. source to, to use those kind of like technology. So, so yeah, the problem is again, uh, I think it's a, it's a vicious circle. First of all, we need That's to have the that. demand and supply gaps huge demand and supply gaps in the developing world. So, so that's something I, I just wanted to highlight. Yeah, so it kind of solved one issue to supply more appliances, but the other issue hadn't been supplied, which is the energy and yes. electricity. <coughs> <coughs> one quick question. Quite related to Paul in particular. Is there any opportunity on the side of sort of demand side management when you're coming from those communities are used already to having load shedding. I know when we visit Nepal, people know we've got four hours in the afternoon, we've got no electricity, don't try and do anything. Yeah. When you can then try and actually have people who are willing to plan out electricity usage, is there any attempt being made at a local government or electricity network to actually use that capacity and build it into design of the network going forward? I think in the Nepal case, um, we actually found that uh, because people are aware of the load shading and they know that they will lose electricity, so uh, a lot of the households, they pay a lot of money to buy batteries themselves to put in their individual <coughs> homes for emergency <coughs> lighting. And they said uh, it's not from government support, they have to actually pay from their own pockets. Is that lithium or old copper? Um, it's, it's not lithium, this is yeah. sand. Yeah. <coughs> Well, just a comment, really. Uh, maybe it's just my bubble, but I think if you took, uh, replicated the similar workshop um, that you did in England, um, in Australia, it would be interesting to see the um, political influence aspects and yeah. whether that would come out because <coughs> so much sensible stuff <coughs> isn't happening and crazy stuff is because of the uh, force of the yeah. fossil fuel industry in the country. Maybe it's not the same, not th to the same degree in England. I think maybe not. Yeah, no, I'm sure there will be a big difference. Yeah, that would be really interesting for the research to do a comparison study. Good for a royal commission to investigate as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you. That's a good point. Okay, let's thanks again for such a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>